are you a DJ? Or what was kind of that, that rationale behind starting a, a DJ startup? Yeah, that, that's right. I am not a DJ, even though I'm Dutch, and there's a lot of great Dutch DJs. AI is the perfect tutor for you to learn more about AI. Any question you have, go deep and learn. And that's a great way for anyone to really ramp on this subject. Because I think any product has the potential to be an AI product. Every company is going to be an AI company because the core capabilities that AI unlocks are going to be so valuable in solving customer problems in a better way. Because what you as a company want to feel is that when a new model is being released, you should be excited because it means your product now is going to be better if you build it the right way. If you feel threatened where you're like, oh no, now this AI model does the thing better than my product, then that's something you want to turn around. How do PMs in the room can really become irreplaceable? Hey, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today's guest is Frank Tepas, Head of Product at Perplexity AI, the answer engine that's taking over Google Search. Founded in 2022, Perplexity AI has already surpassed 10 million monthly active users and is on track to process over 1 billion search queries in 2024. Before joining Perplexity, Frank was a product leader at another unicorn company called Flexport. In this episode, we'll dive into how Frank quickly became an AI expert in such a short period of time, the current AI landscape and its key players across foundational models, LLMs, and applications, the KPIs driving perplexity's explosive growth, how he's shaping an enterprise product distinct from the consumer-facing person, and what PMs can do right now to become replaceable in the AI era. Let's jump in. This episode is brought to you by Sprig, the leading product experience platform that generates AI-powered opportunities to get a deep understanding of your users and continuously improve your product at scale. First, Sprig captures what your users are doing and why through heat maps, replays, surveys, and feedback studies. Then, Sprig analyzes all of the data to generate real-time insights. Sprig AI goes even further with actionable product recommendations to drive revenue, retention, and user satisfaction. Join other world-class product teams such as Figma and Notion Visit sprig.com slash product school to book a demo and get a $75 gift card. That's sprig.com slash product school. Hey, everybody. I'm back. Happy to be back. Uh, I'm the CEO at Product School. Uh, we're the uh, global leader in product training. Our community is over 2 million members at this point. Kind of crazy to think that <laughs> when I started the company 10 years ago, product management wasn't sexy at all. And now look at this. You know, There's a product lounge. There are so many product leaders, both on stage and also in, a, in attendance, so very, very honored to be, to be with you. Um, let's give a special shout out to, and round of applause to Frank, because this is day three after his paternity leave, he has had a baby. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Frank is the head of enterprise product for Perplexity AI. A um, couple of fun facts here. So your company is around two years old, has around 30 people and already an over billion dollar valuation. You guys are trying to take over Google search. Whew. I, I think this could be history in the making. Like if this actually happens, one day we'll be able to say, we were here with the head of product at the next Google search, hopefully. So thank you for being with us. Um, a little bit more about Frank's story. So before he, he started leading the product for perplexity, he led product at Flexport for around six years. And before that, he was a consultant. Right? You came from the Netherlands to the US. Um, so we're going to talk a little, a little bit more about that. I'm an immigrant as well. I'm from Spain. So I'm curious to see if there's any other, raise your hand if any of you are immigrants as well. So a lot of people. Yeah, raise your hand if you're first generation American. Oh my God, it's almost 100%. That's pretty awesome. So Frank, um, your kit is an A, B, C, D, G. What does that mean? Yeah, no, that's a good, good question. And um, everyone, uh, thank you for joining today. Really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate chatting with you, Carlos, and also Merge. Thank you for for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, no, my um, as as you mentioned, Carlos, I uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands, um, moved here. I'm uh, Dutch German, and um, my wife uh, is originally. Her parents are from Hong Kong, so ABCDG is American born Chinese. Dutch, German, so my kids are all over the place and uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. Tiring, so I didn't have a lot of sleep last night, but really excited to be here. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, love that. So another fun fact, so um, are you a DJ or what was kind of that, that rationale behind starting a, a DJ startup? Yeah, that, that's right. I am 
not a DJ, even though I'm Dutch, and there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of great Dutch DJs, so maybe some of it is, is in my blood. But um, no, I, I did a startup um, back in the days, around 2013 to 2017, called Out Loud, which is a social DJ app that enabled everyone who's at an event or a party to jointly collaborate on a playlist and jointly decide on the song that's being played next. Um, and the reason why I did that is that I was doing consulting, which I very much enjoyed, I was doing strategy consulting, but I was really passionate about product. And so I wanted to find an opportunity to go much deeper into product and build a product that like, people love. And so on uh, weekends and during evenings, I built out this, this product where I was sort of designing it, building it, uh, I had a friend in the Netherlands who was coding it, all my salary from consulting would, would be funneled to him so that <laughs> we could build out this, this, this awesome app. And um, you know, this is this uh, an application that ended up getting around 15,000 uh, monthly active users pretty quickly. Um, and it was just really exciting to see sort of how users were engaging with it. It was used at like bars, it was used at college campuses, it was used at work, some large tech companies were using it in their, their cafeterias, it was used at weddings for people's sort of most important days. And so the feedback was very rewarding and fulfilling and uh, uh, yeah, an experience that you know, I very much, uh, very much appreciate. I remember in my early days in Silicon Valley, I was using this app, similar one called turntable.fm. So many people were using that, that was so cool. So um, I was happy to hear that there are other people also trying to do something like that. Um, but let's talk about AI, because I don't know how much AI you actually had to apply into your DJ startup or, or at Flexport, but it's pretty incredible that in a year and a half that you are now at, at Perplexity, uh, you were able to really learn, go deep on AI to the point that you are now building AI for a lot of other people. So how did you acquire AI skills so fast? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So I think, first of all, it's all about, hey, let's you should do the thing that you love, right? You wanna work on a problem that you're super passionate about. That's why I joined Flexport, because uh, they're working on making global trade easy for everyone. And that seems like a problem worth spending uh, all your time on, right? And the same for AI. Like this to me is almost an inflection point for humanity. It is the largest technological development of, of our generations, right? Where it feels like computers are, are coming to life. Uh, and so this is something that I really wanted to contribute to, because. Who knows how far this is going to go? And so, really focused on you know bringing AI into products that it was building. At for example, Flexport, where you have these predictive um, ETAs for when your shipment is going to get at the final destination. And out loud, making sure that uh, we provide personalized recommendations on what song you should add to your playlist. Uh, but then, you know, really focus on on diving deeper into AI. I think the great thing about AI is that. It also helps you learn much more about a certain subject. So AI is the perfect tutor for you to learn more about AI. Any question you have, like go deep and, and learn. I think that's a great way for anyone to really ramp on this subject. So take me back to two years ago, you start getting excited about the field of AI, and then what were your tactical steps to actually acquire those skills so fast? Yeah, so I think on the one hand, like trying, uh, I, I, I try to apply AI wherever possible in, in my current product work, right? Because I think uh, any product, it should be in, or has the potential to be an AI product. Every company is gonna be an AI company because the core capabilities that AI unlocks are gonna be so valuable in solving customer problems in a better way. So I think that was one step, like where do you bring this in? What I then started doing is, okay, I, I wanna also just go much deeper into the field. So I leveraged AI to learn, but what I also did is you know, contacted experts in my network to like have a chat. And almost, you know, when you network to learn, you almost get to do your own private podcast where you're like talking to people uh, and you can cast whatever you want. And like, they, they give you like super smart answers back and you're learning a ton. And so I, you can do that with your network, but also I learned that sort of cold emailing and cold calling, cold reaching out via LinkedIn to people is actually a great way. Like people are super happy to exchange nodes and like teach you and, and explain to you certain concepts around AI. And so that's a great way, it was a great way for me to learn as well. And then as you sort of start looking at, well, what are great AI companies that you'd want to you know, contribute to? I think you can always look at sort of, well, what's the right angle for me to make a meaningful contribution to this company, right? I 
had experience with AI, but I had 15 plus years experience with building enterprise SaaS. And so as Perplexity started to build out their enterprise offering, that was really sort of the angle for me to, to, to make this, this contribution. And I also think that timing is right. Uh, there's a window right now. And so there's a real first mover advantage. Right now, getting into AI will be, I guess, less hard than getting into AI five years from now when the market is much more crowded. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right on the one end, right? Like the, the, the market will be more crowded. Um, I also think that more companies will be AI companies, right? And so on the one end, it'll be harder. On the other hand, hopefully all of our companies are having AI at its core uh, of the product, right? Every company should at least be an AI company, but should strive to be an AI first company and see, okay, where, where can I apply AI, whether it's in my backend or some of my core capability layers or, or my front end, right? Because I think that's what turns your product into a future proof product, where as AI becomes smarter, you want to be able to easily swap out parts of your product with AI capabilities that can now do the thing better. Because what you as a company want to feel is that when a new model is being released, you should be excited because it means your product now is going to be better if you built it the right way. If you feel threatened where you're like, oh no, now this AI model does the thing better than my, my product, then that's something you want to like turn around. You want to leverage sort of these benefits that AI bring to your company. Let's talk about that concept of being AI first. Because that reminds me of the mobile revolution when a lot of companies tried to be mobile first. And not all of them had to or, or were able to do it successfully, right? Like I obviously next generation companies, for them it was more obvious to know, well, my first application is going to be mobile. But there were a lot of other companies that started as a web first company and then it had to transition. So what does being an AI first company and how do companies that didn't start as AI first can move into that direction? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So I think overall, when you, when you think about AI and applying AI to, to your product, I think you can look at like a couple of things. One is how can I leverage AI to move faster? Like if you have a product that, for example, takes data from unstructured documents, that used to be a, a arduous manual task. Now AI can pull that and it's, it's super quick. Two is like, how can I make existing products better? For example, if you have some sort of CSV upload experience, or you know, if you have an analytics product that is really hard, uh, or, or, or a, a reporting product where it's pretty hard for the users to create the right tables, like, hey, those are opportunities to leverage LLMs to make that much easier, right? And then there is uh, sort of the third part of like, hey, leveraging AI to create brand new products. Right? For example, uh, there's this example of a, a coaching startup that now uh, launched an AI coach, right? And so there is a lot of opportunities there, but I, you almost can distinguish uh, three stages, right? You become an AI company, you become an AI first company, and then in the long run, you want to be an AGI first company, right? Artificial general intelligence first. Uh, that's, it's probably a little bit further out, but in terms of AI first, uh, you want to look at AI as a strategic capability for your entire stack, right? Where it's not just a maybe a layer or a wrapper on top of what you've already built, but you want to look strategically at how can I leverage this capability to move faster or create it, like especially create a much better customer experience. And I think what what sort of a more practical uh, application here is that what you've seen over the past sort of decade is that uh, a lot of SaaS companies want to recreate sort of reality within their platform, right? And in a perfect way, like, uh, please uh, uh, users give us all your data in a structured way. We will perfectly sort of map that in our system and then you can do things with that, right? And that can be challenging because it's a lot of work to create those foundational layers. And often users don't like the double data entry uh, or, or having to work across multiple systems. I think what AI is doing is that instead of um, uh, requiring that sort of foundation, uh, you don't need that as much anymore because it can tie more directly into reality. Instead of building a complicated backend, you can just say AI, like if the user asks you this, go do, go do this task and then go do that task. Like find this data point in this document and then go to that document instead of having to digitize all of the documents and building this rule-based engine. And so you see that with a lot of startups and for example, the freight forwarding world as well, where users love their inbox and love managing all of the relationships and customers and vendors through their inbox, instead of bringing that into a system, 
you have an AI layer on top of the inbox that basically reads all of the emails and based on that tells you like, what tasks to work on next. It builds cues for you. It builds analytical insights for you. And so I think there is a paradigm shift around, uh, hey, there is an opportunity to get away with building uh, less and more flexible backends and really focusing on the layer on top and adding value uh, for the customers. And so I think I, I recommend to look at like, hey, how can I make my backend as modular as possible and as AI capabilities improve, you could say, okay, now I'm gonna swap out this part because an LLM can do, or an agent can do that better. This other part I'm gonna keep because that's critical for, for other reasons. And so looking at it that way allows you to sort of look at your entire stack and truly become this sort of AI first company and sort of play the game uh, as AI models improve. Because I think one thing that we're all seeing is these models improve so incredibly fast. And so you wanna be flexible and agile to be able to kind of keep up with that grade and level of development. So now I'm going to try to take us under the hood of perplexity. And I, I read this definition of your company by your CEO. He said that it's like if Wikipedia and ChatGPT had a child, <laughs> Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a good summary, uh, somewhat cryptic, and so I'll add to that as well. I think what we've seen in, uh, and, and you know, very short term, perplexity is an, an AI answer engine. But what is behind this is that you know, in the past decades, I think the World Wide Web has done an, an incredible sort of thing where it like made all of this information available to us. But what, what hasn't changed as much uh, is the way you find and you search for that information. And so that's where uh, perplexity uh, is able to find this opportunity to disrupt and sort of drive this paradigm shift where instead of you searching, getting 10 blue links and then having to kind of search more and dive deeper, uh, it gives you the answer in a very concise way because it will have read through all of the relevant sources and it will have taken out the relevant pieces and then give you that concise answer. And so instead of a search engine is really an answer engine, it gives you that answer. What's also unique uh, about it is that it actually gives you sort of the annotations and references back to the source data. So you can go deeper, but you can also be confident that it's actually basing its statement, statements on uh, like authentic and high authority sources uh, versus potentially like running the risk of hallucinating, right? And so uh, that is sort of the core value proposition. And then the, on top of that, I think what's, what's exciting about perplexity is that it's really looking to sort of help you go through that knowledge sort of discovery journey where you start your, your search, it'll give you this answer, but then it also gives you like thought provoking follow on questions for you to actually go deeper into the subject. And so, yeah, if you're not careful, you're going to get lost and just learn so much in, in the process. And that's really what sort of perplexity is about. And I want to call out sort of the, um, the gravity of that paradigm shift from a search engine to an answer engine, because it, it not only saves you a lot of time when you get the answer right away, because you don't need to read through all of these sources, but it also improves the quality of your research, of your work, of the answer. Because what AI can do is it can look through a wide range of sources yeah, let's say 20 or so sources, it can read all of those sources and then sort of the, uh, like the, the needle in the haystack, pick out the most important information. Um, that's very hard for you to do. You can't, for every question you have, read through 80 documents. Uh, you can only read through a couple, right? And so as a result, you actually get higher quality uh, insights from that. And that is not necessarily as important for the the simpler questions of like, hey, what's, you know, uh, bring me to website X or something, which maybe you would, type into a, a traditional search engine. But once the questions that you have get more complicated, um, that's when sort of the difference starts to show. And that's, I think, especially important for product managers where if you want to do market research or benchmarking, you get, you get so much benefit from that paradigm shift. So maybe it would be helpful if you could help us paint a picture on the AI landscape and, and how you see the different layers and, and how perplexity plays into that. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. So, Obviously, AI is incredibly broad and there's many different spaces. And so if was, let's say, look at the AI assistant landscape. There's sort of three capability areas within this landscape. The first one is sort of the foundation models, right? The models that we are all familiar with, Anthropic and, for example, ChatGPT and, and, and Gemini Deliver. On top of that, you have sort of the 
the application layer that enables users to leverage those models for a specific use case. Now I would say on the side, there's sort of this third area of companies that help, um, that provide the tools to build out those two layers, whether it's for you know, training your models or creating training data or bringing the human in the loop into the process. And so those are really the three capability areas. And so when you look at companies that play in those areas, there's almost like three categories, right? There's the large tech companies like the Googles and the Microsofts of the world that play in all of those areas. They you know, build models, but they also bring it into their suite of applications. They also build the other tools. Then you see the second category of sort of these uh, leading LLM developers like Anthropic, like ChatGPT, right, that have built these foundation models, but are also moving up the stack and building uh, applications that help you leverage those models. And, and then you see the third category of, of startups that are really kind of occupying uh, areas across this field and, and perplexity being one of them, right? Really being focused sort of on building this use case first uh, application on top of these LLMs, right? Which enables perplexity to be LLM agnostic, you pick any model relevant for, for your task, right? And then when you zoom into these uh, AI assistant applications, you can separate sort of consumer from enterprise, right? Uh, perplexity plays in, in both. And when you zoom into enterprise, what you see is that you have these more general purpose uh, AI assistants, as well as assistants that are very much focused on a specific like use case specific vertical. For example, you have an AI system that's focused on law or that's focused on medicine or focused on financial services. And so that's really sort of how you can zoom into the landscape a little bit more. So you mentioned your product has a consumer as well as an enterprise application. So what are some of those specific use cases that, that you are covering in both? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I would say that um, uh, the benefit of being, let's say, both in, in consumer and enterprise, because that's always the question, right? Like, as a product manager, like, how much do you focus versus, like, how much do you kind of cover the broader landscape? And it's an interesting question within AI as well, because you can focus on a use case and get super deep and specific. The benefit of being broad is that you get more data and more insights. For example, on the consumer side, broader applications get more data to train their model and create a broader, sort of stronger capability than if you'd be very focused and, for example, have, have less data. So it's always an interesting trade-off. I would say specifically on, uh, on the enterprise side of things, uh, because I think um, that's you know, especially relevant for, for product managers, I distinguish use cases generally uh, as, as two different types. One is sort of the use case of the AI guides me and creates insights for me. And then the second category is the AI helps me refine and review. If you look at the first category, uh, there's a ton of sort of interesting use cases that, that always excite me as, you know, as a product manager, uh, which ranges from, for example, doing market research. Like, I'm wanting to know more about, well, what are the key players in a market and what are their respective market shares? And perplexity will, will go through sort of multi, multiple steps of reasoning to like give you, give you that answer and actually provide you those, those insights. Or for example, um, wanting to know more about benchmarking, like what, uh, are like CSAT or NPS scores that like top companies in this industry tend to achieve, right? And it'll find sort of those scores. Or doing evaluations of vendor specific tools, like, hey, there's three vendors you're considering using. I want to evaluate them across these five criteria. And Perplexity will find that, give you a table back, uh, and basically give you that framework that you can then use to, to make a decision. And it'll recommend uh, something for you as well in terms of recommendation. Um, what it also does is, and, and use that you know, in, in enterprise or anywhere, is uh, like learning more about, for example, jargon. Like, hey, what does MAU mean? Or like explain it to me, or give me a couple of examples, uh, right? Or best practices, like, hey, what are some great ways for doing brainstorming as a product manager? Or how does company X use the jobs to be done framework, right? So those types of things really drive sort of those insights. And then lastly, I would call out sort of creation of, of content, right? Especially downstream as a product manager, I would say, like, hey, if you want to create um, sales enablement materials or help center articles, just throw all your product documents into the system and it will give you sort of a great starting point for those types of documents. So to me, that is like AI guides me. What I'm also excited about is like AI helps me kind of refine and, and optimize, where let's say you create your Q4 product plan 
uh, what you can do is bring that product plan uploaded in um, perplexity and say, well, take a look at this plan. What are some questions that I should ask myself that I didn't ask myself? Or like, what are other players doing in this space and what am I missing? What should I consider adding to this plan? Do you feel like this plan is focused enough or, or, or not focused enough, right? So it can truly be this sort of sidekick that helps you improve on, on your work. And so I feel like those are some, some very helpful ways, I think, for product managers to like leverage these types of tools. And as you think about success metrics for your own product, kind of as leading indicators to revenue or, or any other goals, what are those? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good one. Like first and foremost, and I think with, with um, any product, right, the, 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 the most important metrics are like, hey, are our customers um, being uh, successful with, with this product? Are we driving value, right? And so some of the things we're looking at is like, okay, like how much faster can customers go through their workflows because now they have perplexity? How much time do they save? Um, how much uh, you know, better is the quality of their work? Uh, how much of a reduction of turnaround time resulted uh, in like leveraging perplexity. And so those are some customer facing metrics. How we then translate that to our own sort of metrics is around like, hey, what's the, what's the quality of the answer, right? And there's metrics that we create internally, but also like, for example, hey, are, are like the citations for every important statement there, or what's the engagement with the answer? Like I mentioned earlier, are they going deeper into those follow on questions? Uh, those are sort of ways to look at like, hey, are the answers driving the value for the customer? And then lastly, I would say, right, from a business perspective, we look at sort of the core metric uh, around uh, the, um, like the, for example, the, the total number of queries on a given day, on a given week, on a given month, because that really um, sort of exemplifies usage of like, how much is this product being used? It, it, it includes sort of retention, it includes new customers being, um, included into the network and includes customers adding more users within their organization. And so those are some of the metrics and layers kind of we look at. No, it, this is very meta, but I actually used perplexity to answer this question for myself <laughs> in terms of success metrics for your product. And uh, this I is what hope, I, I hope I'm close here. Yes, I hope so. It says uh, more than 3 million queries per day, more than 10 million monthly active users and more than 10,000 paid members. Yeah, yeah. so the, the ones I, I talked about were the metrics and in terms of results, yeah, I think those are, those are obviously the right ones. I think uh, another insight we posted uh, recently was that in the past month, there were 250 million searches done. Um, in 2023, there were 500 million searches done. So it also tells you something about the, the level of growth of, of the product right now. And how do you measure retention? We basically look at um, sort of the uh, the cohorts, right, of users, which I think we, we, we generally look at, right, of like, okay, if you searched uh, on week one and you leveraged the product on week one, what percent of users use that product on week two? And then what percent use it on week three, right? And so we're trying to make sure that um, users sort of love the product and continue to use it and optimize the experience for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about monetization because as you think about the paradigm shift that is to be an answer engine versus a search engine, I can imagine that the business model could change too, right? Like Google could be incentivized by making people click on those blue links. Well, if you are providing a summary and a, of, of their answer, how, how does that impact how you monetize your product? Yeah, great, great question. So... I think what's great about perplexity is that um, right now it's, it's sort of a user first product. Like the entire product experience is focused around creating the best possible user experience. So there's no like ads or you know alterations being made to the sources that would like change the the sequencing of the sources. Like we, there's no sponsored sources that were moved to the top. The sources that are being selected are solely selected based on what are the most accurate, relevant, highest authority sources that give you that best answer. Um, and so that's the focus, but to your point, monetization needs to happen. And so I think in the world of AI, there's different ways and new ways of, of monetizing, right? On the one hand, of course, a lot of the AI players have sort of paid plans. Um, what you're seeing as well is sort of the use of, of ads, but in, in different ways. Like for example, um, 
you wouldn't necessarily use the ads to, to change the sources, but you would use the ads in, in other ways um, to make sure that the answer is never compromised. Um, obviously, moving into the enterprise space um, is another way of, of monetization. So there's different monetization levers, and you sort of got to find the ones um, that, that are the most impactful. Thank you. So you lead the enterprise product. Right? So how is that enterprise product different than your consumer one? Yeah, no, for sure. So when we launched the enterprise product, what we mostly focused on is like take this consumer product that like everyone loves and, and bring that into the enterprise. Because what you generally see is that within companies, users and, and, and employees love to use AI assistance. But everyone, especially IT administrators, everyone really is super concerned that you're putting sensitive data in there and all of a sudden it was used to train a model and now it's being shown to everyone else, right? And so um, what we focused on is to you know, bring that consumer grade app to the enterprise, but build in sort of this enterprise grade level of, of security and safety, right? And so a, a key call out there is, for example, that we would never train or fine tune any model uh, with customer data. And so you can be insured your customer data is secure. And so there's a bunch of, bunch of other things like SOC 2 compliance and that we're all familiar with. And that enabled sort of employees to now start leveraging this consumer grade product within, within their organizations and, and they love it, right? I think the second layer that you, that you see that you have to focus on is sort of helping users understand the art of the possible, right? I think what you see in the, on the consumer side is if someone like leverages perplexity or, or pays for it, they tend to be early adopters they tend to know quite a bit about AI and they know exactly kind of what they want to do with it. What you see on the enterprise side is that there's usually a number of sort of champions that bring the product uh, into the organization and then you know, bring it to every employee. And so there's a good portion of employees that may have never used um, an, an AI assistant. And so helping them understand how they can use this tool to do their job in a better way uh, is another critical piece to, to look at, right? And so you, if, for example, you know that this is a user at a financial services company you know, that is in sales, you can show them like, hey, these are some ways for you, for you to use the product. And so that, I would say, making that come to life is, is even more important uh, in, in the enterprise. And so those are, those are some ways. And then maybe lastly is you, you, will, you have opportunities to sort of start customizing um, the product and, and improving the product based on the, the most important use cases, right? And so what's different with the consumer product is that um, consumers have, have just a, a, a ton of like needs that are that are broad, but within the enterprise, someone tends to be in a specific vertical and in a specific function or at a specific level of seniority. And so you have the opportunity to sort of drive um, drive specific improvements uh, to, to meet those more specific use cases. Yeah, so I want to double down on that. How do you go about prioritizing your enterprise roadmap, given that? you have so many different clients and, and use cases. Yeah, for sure. Uh, prioritization within an AI company is, is interesting because what you tend to see is that, um, and folks would especially say that just when LLMs came out, is that use cases seem to be almost infinite because you can put anything into an AI system. So should you still think about use cases or should you think about the technology? I think the answer is clear. The trend is okay, we, the use case is key. key. It's always about solving a customer problem and optimizing the experience around solving that problem. And so you, you see that trend, right? Like even the, the leading players are now building more and more tooling on top of their models to make sure that you can serve that specific uh, user need. And so um, when you want to prioritize, you wanna make sure that you can identify and, and target the most important use cases and then build more tailored experiences to that. And I would say there's, there's sort of three use case levels that, that, that you can distinguish. One is sort of the, the higher level use case, like is this like, like a, a specific vertical in financial services or you know, is this a, a law kind of case? You can then go down to sort of the question category. Is this like a, a complex question? Because if it is, we should probably show more reasoning steps. If it's a simpler question, we can give a, a shorter answer, right? If, is, is it a question about uh, a travel or shopping, like you can tailor the experience to that. And then you can go even down to the sort of atomic question, atomic query of like, okay, if, 
Like if you an analyze the data and you're like, oh, okay, 10% of users asked about the weather on our app. Well, then you build a, a weather widget and a specific experience for that question. So understanding the value that you want to deliver to your customers by doing these sort of analyses of the, the, the millions and millions of queries um, and then tailoring the experiences to that so you can create the most value is sort of the process we go to. And then I would say the second step is moving super fast. I think one thing that Perplexity does well is it moves very quickly in executing, right? The goal is to ship every week. And I think one of the things that they've done really well is to, and as a startup, it's a little bit easier, is to minimize sort of the level of process within the organization, right? Um, if you can minimize the amount of reporting you do, if you can keep your teams lean so there's less coordination necessary, all of a sudden you have all this extra time to do actual work, build product, move super fast. And now that there's such great AI, the, the rate of learning uh, can speed up as well. Maybe it would have been a, a research session with a couple of people that would take a couple of days. Now you'd ask the question to an AI system and it'll just help you. And so leveraging AI within your operating model to learn and move much faster is also a great way to then you know, accelerate on the execution. So we are doing this event at the, in parallel with Dreamforce and they are talking about enterprise AI as the next big wave. And where are we in the adoption curve for enterprise AI? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think that um, uh, you see a couple of different sort of uh, themes here. One is enterprises are um, all seeing the importance of, of leveraging AI to improve their products, but also improve their businesses. And so I think what you see is you see uh, enterprises leveraging uh, models and then trying to build uh, systems on top of that. So them taking on a lot of the work. Uh, I think that is, is possible, but it's requiring a, a ton of investment because you got to bring in the AI experts to leverage those models to then build um, you know, the applications uh, that you want to build in-house. I think the other wave is that you see sort of enterprise SaaS companies and bringing AI into their applications uh, so that when enterprises want to adopt AI, they don't need to have a range of experts. They leverage sort of the applications that are now AI first um, and make sure that they add their secret sauce to that. For example, a lot of enterprises have really great valuable data to fine tune models, to train models, to you know, bring into the application as a source using retrieve rag, retrieval augmented generation. And so um, I think there's sort of these two, two shifts happening. And in the long run, I think everyone will sort of educate themselves and uh, you know, build these great applications themselves. Um, I think in the near term, you see a lot of the enterprise SaaS players going AI first. I think we drive down to 101, it's only we're an AI first company. And so I think that's where where um, you know where things are, are are heading to right now. I think one thing that I'm excited about is um, to sort of see those magical AI experiences that you see in, for example, perplexity, in my opinion, uh, or that uh, when you use ChatGPT, um, you will start to see those within uh, products of, of the average enterprise. And you're like, wow, that is actually smart, actually good experience. Because that, that will eventually happen, happen. Everyone is investing so much in this that we'll see these sort of magical experiences happen a lot more often. So let's talk about some of those magical experiences. Because when, when AI started becoming mainstream, everything seemed to be a co-pilot. And after that first magical experience, everybody started thinking, well, you know, there has to be more than that. And now we're talking about agents. So what's your take on, on, on agents as a, as a true innovation over kind of co-pilots? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think that um, agents are this, this very exciting development. And when I say agents, this refers to um, the AI being able to do more complicated tasks and almost setting up a plan and applying reasoning to complete more complex tasks. And I think that's what we're looking for, right? Like, some folks said, oh yeah, the original um, LLMs felt more like a party trick. It's, it's kind of cool, but it hallucinates and uh, like it doesn't help me a lot with the, the insights that I really want. And that's where like agents are gonna get more robust to do these more complex analyses, right? And so I think there's a wide range of agents. And so you could argue that today these agents exist. Like if you go to, for example, perplexity and you have a, a more complex question, it will go through three steps and it'll show you its sort of reasoning, and then it'll like show you the results and show you the final answer. And I think that's where 
things are going to get a, a lot more robust, right? Where you can get even more complex sort of like desk research questions uh, answered. Um, but then, of course, agents can can be applied in different ways. Let's say you want agents to, in the future, um, actually reach out to your customers and, and interview them and actually learn more directly from customers. Uh, that will that that'll be an agent, but that requires sort of the agent to have a, a natural voice. It requires the agent to like uh, you know deal with with human unstructured feedback with with messiness like out in the real world. And so I think that'll that'll be another example. What you also see is agents you know needing to be able to actually control UIs. And so there's you know applications being built where agents can go on to the United websites to book to book a flight for you, right? And so. I think there's capabilities needed still for agents to be able to operate in sort of a multimodal sort of real world situation. It's being able to in, like insert itself into existing applications. It needs to know if it's a personalized one, your preferences, where on the plane do you like to sit? Like if I book the ticket for you, uh, where do you like to stay if I book a hotel for you? And it needs to have sort of this um, self improving sort of reasoning kind of capability where if if you get some feedback, you adjust the model and you, you learn. And I think that is sort of an exciting long-term trend as well to me, where now models are released periodically. And when it's released, it's you know, fine-tuned, but somewhat static. But I think at some point, you'll have models where you create one model and it will improve itself. It will continuously improve based on learnings. And you, will, you won't have to create another model, right? So I think those are some of the developments in terms of, in terms of agents. I think one more call out there that a lot of folks talk about is, is RAG, right? Uh, where it's, it's standing for retrieval augmented generation, where instead of um, models or agents leveraging the knowledge that they have baked inside of the model, they will instead tie into uh, sources that you have connected this agent or this, this model to. So you know that this is data that is accurate because you've assigned it, right? And so separating the sort of the communication LLM layer from the, from the brain, from the knowledge, I think is also powerful for, for more use cases and, and a reduction in, for example, hallucination. Well, thank you, Frank. I want to switch gears <clears throat> and talk a little bit more about AI within product teams and kind of address a few elephants in the room here. First of all, it's this debate around the AI PM versus the PM that knows AI. So what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. I think my take on this is that I think um, every PM will be an AI and should be an AI PM, just like every product will be an AI product, right? Like it is a core capability that you now have in your pocket to solve a customer problem in a better way. Because technologies don't really matter. What matters is solving the customer problem in the best possible way, making the most impact for our customers. And it's very likely that AI, Gen AI, LLMs will always play a role in solving the customer problem in a better way. I, I mentioned a couple of examples. And so in order for you to then build the best possible product, you need to know what's possible from an AI perspective. And sure, you'll have AI experts that help you with training the model or help you with fine tuning. Um, but as a PM, you need to be very familiar with AI and the latest developments so you can build the best product because that's, that's what it's all about for us. This reminds me of the mobile era when a lot of PMs were calling themselves mobile PMs or uh, Android or uh, you know, uh, iPhone PMs. And now it's just a PM that understands mobile the same way they understand other applications. So do you think there is a room for an AI-specific PM, or is it just an understanding that all PMs will need to master AI? Yeah, that, that to me is it, right? Like all PMs need to master AI. I think there's always going to be exceptions depending on, on the company type, um, but all PMs need to be able to understand how to leverage AI to solve a customer problem. So then the follow-up on that is how do PMs in the room can really become irreplaceable? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and that's a, a great question. Will we all be replaceable at some point? I don't think so, but uh, who knows? I think that AI is sort of providing a tremendous opportunity for every PM um, to do even more of the work that they love doing. Because I think um, AI enables PMs to do more of sort of the most important product work. Because for example, AI can take care of 
writing status reports because it knows what's going on and it can create it for you. It can help with creating enablement materials. It can help with tracking metrics and like coming up with insights. It can do the more granular parts of the research so that we can, as PMs, can focus on the most important work, right? And the most important work to me is understanding the customer, understanding the customer problem, going incredibly deep, sort of creating new insights from that, and then coming up with creative product solutions, sort of connecting the dots um, across a wide range of insights that you've gathered to then build the best possible product. And so we will have much more time to really focus uh, on doing that. And then you leverage AI as your sidekick to like challenge you and be like, hey, have you considered this? Or like, you should ask yourself this other question, right? And so AI will help you focus on the most important work and also be a sidekick for you to then do that most important work even better. And as you think about the most important work, how can we even leverage AI to help us with that? Yeah, so I think it's it's um, uh, it's sort of that that sidekick kind of thing, right? Where um, it, it AI can, on the one hand, speed up the process that you're going through to, like, for example, understand the customer problem. It can set up your interviews, or it, at some point, can even do the interviews, um, right? And so it can help you with the more um, granular parts of, of of the research. But I think. You know, being that sidekick that can challenge you, um, I think is incredibly powerful there. And, and as said, right, as mentioned earlier, if you create your strategic plan for the year where you need to connect an immense amount of dots, AI can help you with like moving a lot faster with the, with the various market research or best practices or, or methods for you to like generate more ideas. And so that's, I would say, how, how, you know, how we can leverage AI with the most important. And, and I love that because I think there's this misconception around, well, AI is going to be leveraged by the ICs to do some of their mundane work. And that's true. Plus, I believe that this can be leveraged by product executives as well to do some of that strategic work, board prep, and other things that maybe they still can't fully delegate, but they still can turbocharge. Agree. 100% agree, right? I think having them be that sidekick that, that can advise you on some of these things, I think what... What I would recommend as well is that there's a lot of sort of talk about, hey, let, let the AI create your PRD or something. I personally don't believe in that because I think for the upstream work that a PM does, creating a strategic plan, um, creating you know, your Q4 plan, your strategy, your PRDs, like thinking through that yourself, um, getting a crisp perspective on the value prop, um, is so incredibly valuable. Or you know, we've all had it, right? When you write your PRD, like while you write it, you, it, it gets 20% better because you come up with five more edge cases or ideas, right? And so having uh, LMs do that is like almost a loss. Like you, you lose sort of the, uh, the control over your own product. I think, again, it's great for once it's done to have them review it. Or what, or what you could do is like, okay, you create your Q4 plan, but then you have the AI also create a Q4 plan uh, based on all the knowledge it has and it'd be like, oh, is mine better or is it, hopefully yours still better, but like there's good insights that you can probably leverage for your plan, right? So that's how I, how I see using AI for those types of things. Well, Frank, thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome to do this deep dive on, on AI with you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Carlos.